project. It's very nice to uh, see you, uh, Mr. Falkway. Welcome to uh, New Hampshire. <laughs> thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me. Thank you for having me present for this illustrious audience. Yeah. Unfortunately, uh, I'm uh, not able to come to the United States anymore. The country is no longer the shining beacon of freedom that I learned it to be growing up. So, yeah, we're, um, we're sorry about that, but we are working here as hard as we can to fix that. Yeah, and we'll come to exactly that. I'm so happy. There are really passionate people who want to make America the beacon of liberty yeah. that it deserves to be. So for those of you in the audience who, who aren't familiar with uh, Rick Falkvink, he is the founder of the Swedish Pirate Party, uh, starting in uh, 2000, well, 2009 was the first election, right? Um, and he figured out how to organize a very large group of, uh, especially uh, young people in Sweden, uh, on very short notice with very limited resources and basically run circles around the competition um, to, to get the word out and to get people motivated, to get activists coordinated. Uh, went on to write a book called Swarmwise about those techniques um, and has continued to study um, how best to do that, has given TED Talks on the subject. Um, uh, also, uh, the, the Pirate Party was founded in part on, uh, uh, on a response to the regime of IP uh, and copyright protection. Um, and so uh, Rick and I began a conversation uh, several months ago about what we're doing here in New Hampshire with the Free State Project and all the, the different individuals and, and organizations that are performing different uh, kinds of activism here, and uh, he thought that was very interesting, and uh, I thought he could share with us some of his uh, perspective on, on what he's done and how we can uh, do what we're doing here even better and, and more effectively. So please give a warm welcome to Rick Fluffing. Thank you so much for the introduction. And again, I wish I could have been there in person and met a near, all of you, shared a beer and so on. But I have been too close friends to reporters, too critical of the regime. And so I've ended up on very lists that don't sound so bad in themselves. But frankly, I can't guarantee my safety anymore. And it's sad, it's really sad state of affairs. But it can be fixed and with the help of people like you, it will be fixed. Because America has a really, really strong sense of liberty. That simply does not exist elsewhere. And I, I believe that this will come back one way or another. So I'm really happy there are people working to, to change America into what it, what it deserves to be. Today, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how to organize for liberty and how to run circles around the competition. Because there are many, many books on how to organize out there, but and frankly, all of them make certain assumptions that just isn't true when you're organizing for liberty, and in particular, when you're organizing liberty activists. So I'll do a little <coughs> introduction about who I am, where I'm coming from, to so that you'll have a better sense of my background, talk about how we achieved those results that we did achieve with the Pirate Party. We beat the competition in the group that everybody is gunning for, the youth vote. And we did so on less than 1% of the competition's budget. We were more than two orders of magnitude more cost efficient. Two orders of magnitude. And there's a trick to it. It's easy when you know how, like everything is easy when you know how to do it. <laughs> so we're going to go through that, go through how working with liberty can help you succeed for liberty. Talk a little bit about how to set your goals in order to attract people to work like this and how to optimize this organization. So, a little bit of who I am. I'm an entrepreneur at heart. I was 
born and raised in the second city of Sweden. I am now moved to Stockholm, which is the capital, and then I'm about to move to Berlin, down to the European mainland. I'm an entrepreneur at heart. I founded my first company at age 16. I have my first employee at age 18, so I think Wikipedia describes me as a serial entrepreneur. In any case, I've, I'm not really the 9 to 5 type. I like building things. I like building movements. I like inspiring people. So, in 2006, I set up this idea of the Pirate Party, essentially a libertarian idea, but with attracting people from the economic right and the economic left that had this libertarian streak underneath. And it turned out to work very well. We got elected in 2009 on this platform of essentially digital rights. But in that way, you can also see us as a very conservative movement because what we're fighting for is the same rights our parents have, the ability to send a letter anonymously to anybody and that isn't tracked or sealed, and which is sealed in transit. Our children don't have that right because the copyright industry doesn't like it, and that's a very sad state of affairs. So we're fighting for something as very, very basic as our children to inherit the liberties of our parents, and today they are not This ID caught on, it's spread, the Pirate Party has spread to between 50 and 7 countries, depending on how you count. And Basically, my proof of concept in 2009 was showing that you can get elected to office as a liberty activist. You don't need to take all this abuse and this corruption and this nepotism sitting down. So after that, after that election, you know, I stepped down in 2011 from uh, operations in the Swedish Pirate Party and have spent my day talking about how you can share the law, how you can spread liberty how you can use these experiences of how we succeeded to help succeed for liberty elsewhere. I wrote a book about it, I'm going to come back to that. It is free for download as a PDF, so this is not a sales pitch. Uh, I'm also uh, writing a blog called Falkvinia on Liberty, which you can access at falkvinia.net. So talking about organizing for liberty. Oh, and by the way, there's a bunch of awards and recognition, but, you know, these, uh, these magazines, uh, uh, in terms of introductions, these magazines that post these awards, they are also after selling, selling their magazines, so I know, I'm not sure how, how much value to, uh, to ascribe to it, but it could still be mentioned that Time Magazine nominated is one of the world's 100 most influential people overall, foreign policy, named me one of the 100 most important global thinkers and so on. There, there has been a number of really interesting and prestigious, I guess I would call it, awards. In any case, organizing for labor. We had two orders of magnitude of cost efficiency advantage, the way we organized the Pirate Party. And there were a number of key, insight, key insights that led us to have that kind of advantage. I'm going to go through them. We had a budget of $50,000. Our competition had six million between them. And we beat them. We beat them. We became the largest party in the youth vote, which everybody is going for. No, we did get the older vote in the same degree, mostly because they don't see the need to fight for digital rights like the younger generation does, for very natural reasons. Still, we became the largest party in, in the youth demographic, giving us just over 7% overall. That doesn't sound like a lot in a state by, in a country like the US, where you get 51% or not, but in a country like, with proportional representation, that means you get 7% of the seats. That means we kick politicians out of office. That means we win to the European Parliament. And we're still there, all, all of from another country, Germany. There is a paradox when you're organizing for liberty. Socialists tend to have a much easier way or easier time organizing because it runs in their veins to run an oppressive collective. <laughs> 
as a libertarian, you you'd have a more you find more people saying that. Who are you to tell me what to do? <laughs> <laughs> so you need to make people want to go where it benefits the movement of their own volition, because they are not taking orders. We are not taking orders. None of us are taking uh, are taking orders. Not because we're not good at it, just because we choose when and when not to. So, in, when organizing for liberty, you need a different kind of organization that has existed before. And fortunately, the, the net has enabled just such an organization. Nobody has described this that I'm aware of, except for, except for this book that uh, which I'm going to mention later, or I can mention it now as well. It, look, it looks like this. I'm going, to sh I'm going to show it and give it. Away. And the key insight here is that when we used to organize maybe 50,000 people like we were at the Pirate Party, then just pulling a number out of thin air, you might need 4,000 hours of organizing per week. Let's just pull that number out of thin air. 4,000 hours of work per week. It used to be, in order to have that, that you needed to hire 100 people working 40 hours a week. You needed 40 full-time staff. And that's a huge bar to pass. I don't have that money. I, nobody fighting for liberty as an activist has that money. Only the, the oppressive incumbents has that kind of money, which are the ones you're trying to beat. And you sure can't beat them with resources. You can't outspend them. That's not, that's not okay, you're gonna win. So, instead, the key insight here is that if you're saying that I'm going to do this and everybody who wants to join me is more than welcome to do so. And what happens is that when you create an organization that gives other liberty-minded activists a leverage for their own work effort. If they're working on their own, they get one X output. If they're working through your movement, they get 1.5 X output or 2 X output. Then they have a profit motive to work with you. They will do that on their own volition. The hours they would spend in their spare time, maybe two hours a day, let's go with two hours a day, sorry, two hours per week, two hours per week. They will choose to spend through your organization out of pure self-interest. And so organizing for liberty by voluntarious principles actually works. It actually works. So these 4,000 hours, instead of getting them from 100 full-time employees, you can get them from 2,000 volunteers who choose to work with your movement of their own volition because it benefits them. So it becomes a profit motive for everybody. You get to work for what you believe in. These 2,000 people get to work for what they believe in. And you don't need to pay them. There's also that. It's a rather important rather, rather <laughs> part of it. So, this wasn't possible before the net. And no single book on organizing I've seen describes this. How you can use the individual self-interest to build a cohesive movement. Instead of having big meetings where people vote about what other people must or cannot do. There's no coercion here. None. We're using the self-interest. We're using the profit motive. So, however, not every task is very suited to this kind of organization. When you're starting and setting out to do something, and actually the Free State Project is excellently suited for this. When you're setting out to do something, you need to set 
the stake in the ground, hammered down for everybody to see, with a flag shining high. And that goal needs to have four specific criteria. That goal needs to be tangible, inclusive, credible, and epic. <laughs> Like, it, it needs to be tangible. A lot of people are starting organizations with a goal like, I don't know, you know, we should all like, I don't know. <laughs> well, feeling good is nice, but it's not gonna attract a lot of people. They, they can feel good on their own. It needs to be inclusive. Anybody who sees this goal needs to see, yes, there's my spot. And I want, I want to be a part of this, and I'm going to jump right in there. It needs to be credible. As in, you're, you're doing something big here, but you still need to make it plausible that you can pull it off as a group. And part of that is for setting a project plan from A to B. Even if B has never been done before, as long as you can present a series of steps that will take you from present time to B, then it will look credible. And last but not least, epic. I used to, I used to say shoot for the moon. And then, I used, and then I used to add, on the other hand, don't shoot for the moon. Because we've already been there. It's not epic enough. <laughs> Shoot for Mars. Then Elon Musk said and went and set that goal and, get, and stole all the thunder. So there's that. <laughs> so shoot for Mars, that's epic. As compared, if you have these four components, you will attract what I call a swarm almost immediately. You'll have, like I had, hundreds of people overnight.